As you know, we are in the midst of the WWE draft. Yo, sports guys talking wrestling. We love drafts. Of course, I've covered the NFL draft several times, and in, you know that's always a, a pleasure. Now we get to cover a WWE draft, and it's unique, just like everything else has been unique in, unique in WWE this year. Well, what better way to celebrate draft day than to bring on on the Vaqueros Cafe and Cantina Hotline, the WWE Champion, Drew McIntyre. Follow him on Twitter at WWE. How you doing, Drew? I'm fantastic, sir. Thank you for having me. I'm a little bit nervous, of course, because as you mentioned already, today is draft day, so every single WWE superstar in Ryan SmackDown no longer has a home. That's right. We're about to find out where we're going to spend our future, be it on SmackDown, or Raw. That's that's true. And I want to get to that here in just a second. I was going to ask first, I've watched your WWE 24 documentary, The Chosen One, and uh, you know that's one of the things WWE Network does so well. I would I would definitely put them on that level with the ESPN 30 for 30s. It is they are so well done. One of the things I saw you you put out a tweet that you wouldn't be able to rewatch parts of it. Explain that to to the fans. Yeah, I mean, the 24, um, as I wanted it to be, and told WWE Network was do not hold back, told my family and friends, don't hold back, tell the true story. And not just the good times, the bad times, and the really, really bad times, because I don't want to lie you know, to my fans, and I want them to know exactly who I am, and hopefully it can inspire them, especially during these difficult times, that the night's always darkest before the dawn. But there are certain parts that are difficult to watch back, obviously. The time of my life when my mother got sick and inevitably passed. And when I talk about that in the documentary, I can't watch that and watch myself talking about it. It's hard to watch my dad get emotional about it also. And even like uh, even watching my dad, look how proud he is of me and thanking my wife for looking after me and helping me finally grow up from a boy in my early career and getting fired to finally becoming a man because she's a huge part of my story. So those parts are pretty difficult for myself to watch, but I wanted to let the world in to the McIntyre family, the Galloway family, and tell them my true story. No no details left out. I absolutely loved it. Uh, I connected, especially when you talked about your mother. I lost my mother. around. I was probably about the same age you were uh, when you lost yours, and so that spoke to me uh, really heavily. Something I've noticed, and, and it's it's kind of this funny thing, and I, I've grown a beard because, you know, it's that time where everybody's been growing beards. And, you know, the documentary showed back when you had that clean shaven, almost like a, a baby face, <laughs> not, not in the term, not in the usual, you know, context we usually use that. So let me ask you this. You got that beard. You're looking rugged. Has it, has the thought ever crossed your mind of going back clean shaven? Uh, absolutely not. I, uh, still look about 15 underneath this beard. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I think the beard is a key, key, a key part of my new look. I know when I was younger, you know, I looked like one of those Abercrombie and Fitch models like <laughs> or, coat or something or, or like an under a swimsuit model or something. But it wasn't just the fact that I was a lot lighter back then, a lot leaner back then, you know, that that face but although i look like i've eaten the previous version of myself i'm about 270 pounds now underneath this beard is still that baby face and it doesn't quite complete the rugged scottish look to take it off plus i accidentally shaved it one time a few years ago and my wife was mortified it's the first time she's seen me clean shaven and she was like Ugh. you know i think i'm gonna have to wait till some hair comes back in your face you look a little bit young for me i th- you know i think it's the women in our lives that kind of keep us i my girlfriend, she loves my beard, so she has she has pretty much threatened me with bodily harm if I try to shave it off. So I totally understand. We're talking with Drew McIntyre, <laughs> the WWE champion. Let me ask you this. One of the things I noticed, you mentioned that the one of the first wrestling books you ever got was Have a Nice Day by Mick Foley. Do you still have that copy? Uh, I do. I have the very copy that was in the documentary. Cause I, that day in 2017, the footage was from when I just returned to NXT, returned to WWE, after a three-year hiatus, I was going through my stuff as WWE filmed me, and I took some stuff back to America, and I have a nice day as I picked it up live on the camera. I went, wow, this is the first book I ever read, cover to cover. Amazing how many English essays I wrote up to that point without reading the whole book. 
but that was the first book I actually read from cover to cover. I finished it in four days. And, you know, you know, but I don't know if the audience is aware that that is a very big book, a very thick book. And to plow through it in four days means you're basically reading that book all day, every day while somehow going to school. And I made a note inside the book exactly how long it took for me to read it because I was blown away. Wow, you actually read a book from cover to cover. Your English teacher would be so impressed if you'd do that with a Merchant of Venice or something. Right, I, I get it. Uh, I have I have that book as well. I bought it way back then. I was uh, fortunate enough last year saw Mick Foley. He was doing this "Have a Nice Day" tour where he would read stories or, or tell the stories from the book, and he did it here at a comedy club here in Austin and uh, talked to him afterwards. Such a such a wonderful man and such a great book. I mean, just you gotta love Mick Foley and such a great writer. So let's transition to the draft. You're you're in the group that is eligible today. So tonight on SmackDown on Fox, you're in that group. So there's a question I always ask college football players when they're getting ready for the NFL draft. So I'm gonna ask you the same thing. Is there is there a team you're you're wanting to play for? Is there a side that you're preferring, or 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 am I going to get the the usual answer I get from them? I'm just happy to be able to play for somebody. Yeah, I mean, I I am very proud of uh, of everything I've done as WWE champion and achieved with Raw. Um, So I wouldn't be sad at all if I continued on with Raw because, you know, that's where I won the WWE championship. That's the brand I've been trying to, you know, hold in my back during a worldwide pandemic. And, you know, it's got a special place in my heart. So I certainly would be smiling if that happened. But at the same token, if I end up in SmackDown, it's a new world, a new challenge. The WWE title will be coming with me, and there's some exciting match prospects. So it's exciting either way, but I am very proud of what I've done on Raw thus far. Uh, absolutely. I think you have. It's been, I tell you what, this this growth that you've had leading up to WrestleMania when you won the WWE Championship and now being WWE Champion, it has been just a, so much fun to watch. If you had told yourself your yourself back in 2007, 2008, that this is the way you were going to become WWE champion in 2020, would you have believed it? Yeah, absolutely not. Like in 2007, 2008, if you told me I was going to become WWE champion, I would have said, absolutely, of course I am, because I was such a cocky kid. It was probably around like, you know, 13, 14, when I wasn't the most confident. You told me I was going to become champion in general. I wouldn't have believed you because I'd lost all my confidence by that point. But if at any point in my life you told me I was going to pull it off, and we were going to be in a worldwide pandemic. And, uh, you know, WWE would be the only show in town bringing the world an escape, bringing them original content. And you're going to be leading the charge for Monday Night Raw. I definitely wouldn't have believed you. Right. I, I, I totally get it. You know, the documentary goes through your journey through independent wrestling. You know, you talked about that time off. Of course, you you worked in TNA. You worked at ICW and and throughout the British scene. Um, You worked in Evolve. What was the what was the, I guess, most surprising lesson that you still carry with you to this day from that journey? And a lot of it was such a surprise. Um, and just the things we were able to achieve um, were such surprises. You know, it was an incredible growth period for wrestling in general outside of WWE. And I was fortunate to be the face of a lot of companies leading the charge. But I guess that was the most surprising part when I returned to uh, the UK with ICW and multiple promotions there or Evolve in America or different companies across the world. The way people kind of looked up to me as a leader and you see in the documentary, you hear me talk about it. You know, I was really not confident at the time. You know, where I was at in my career, I hadn't been anything serious for a few years and hadn't really had any microphone time, hadn't really had much ring time, wasn't feeling so sure about myself. But everyone came up to me, just looking up to me. And that kind of surprised me, I guess, and it motivated me to be better and finally step up and become that leader so many people believed I could be and become that superstar so many people believed I could be. And as much as they looked up to me, I kept a face, like a straight face on, and I kind of faked it until I grew into that role. But if it wasn't for so many others it's around me, supporting me and believing in me, I wouldn't have stepped up. And as much as they thanked me for being a leader, realistically, we, that incredible growth period for wrestling outside of WWE was all done side by side, not being able to lead the charge. But I was very surprised 
when everyone kind of came to me and looked up to me as Drew, you're the one, you're going to take us to the next level. And that really helped me and motivated me to become the guy I am today. Absolutely. One, you kind of kind of related to that, something you said about naturally being introverted. And you mentioned about, you know, the confidence and such. Do you see that in, in your peers today? Is that is that common among your peers today? Uh, it's probably like any work environment. You've got the ones that are, you know, a little a little more quiet and the ones that are a little louder and the ones that just have to be the center of attention every two seconds. Even if you're really trying to shut them out or pay attention to whatever you're doing, they just have to be the center of attention. I don't think it's just WWE. I think it's every walk of life. But for me personally, yes, surprising to some people, they go, you've been on television basically your whole life and around cameras your whole life. And I have to tell them, like, yeah, I'm pretty much more comfortable when someone puts a red light on me or I'm in a wrestling ring or I have a microphone in my hand or a camera stuck in my face than I am in public situations. My wife and I always joke that, you know, we were built for a pandemic because we really don't do anything. We hang around the house, we sit on the couch with our cats, and that's, you know, our idea of a good time. And outside of that, my idea of a good time is in a wrestling ring entertaining the fans where right. I'm most comfortable. I, I do some work on the independent scene here here in, in Austin and Central Texas, and I hear that all the time from, from those those wrestlers as well, that this pandemic was, you know, a godsend for them because, like, like you, they'll just stay at home and, and, you know, play with their pets, whether it's cats, dogs, whatever, I get that. So no matter what happens with the WWE draft, you still have this rivalry with Randy Orton. And you've got this match coming up at Hell in a Cell with the with the Viper, and I got to ask you: Have you figured out why he's so angry? He just does he need a hobby like maybe you know gardening, painting? I hear needlepoint can be very soothing. What's your take on it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you think after being at the top of WWE for essentially twenty years and being coddled the whole time and you know had the old silver spoon in his mouth the whole time. Not taking away from his talent. The, the reason he got all those, you know, opportunities because he was so naturally talented. But after all these years at the top, you think he'd have a big smile on his face by now, but nope. Old Randy's always upset. If he doesn't get his own way, he doesn't get the WWE championship, my WWE championship that he wants, he throws all his toys out of the crib. He can't control himself and he does something completely insane like challenge Drew McIntyre to hell in the cell match. So I don't I guess I didn't beat him up enough. Um, at SummerSlam when I defeated him. I guess I didn't help him with enough weapons during the ambulance match when I defeated him at Clash of Champions that he challenged me to Hell in the Cell. And I'll let you in, in a little secret. There's a reason he used to call me the psychopath. It's because I have this other side <laughs> to me. If you're locking yourself in a cell with me and he challenged me, trust me, I'm not locked in there with Randy Orton. He's locked in there with Drew McIntyre and I'm going to mess him up. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, you know, I, I just feel I feel bad for him because he always looks like somebody peed in his Cheerios. So we're talking with Drew McIntyre, the WWE champion, as he's getting ready for, for the WWE draft. Drew, before I let you go, we always try to get show IDs from, from our guests and, and uh, everyone that we talk to. So I was wondering if, if we could record one right here. It's real simple. You know, this is Drew McIntyre. And the name of the show is Sports Guys Talking Wrestling. Sports Guys Talking Wrestling. Yes. So whenever you're ready, Andy? I'm going to cut out and let you go. This is your WWE champion, Drew McIntyre. You're listening to Sports Guys Talking Wrestling. Perfect. One take, Drew. There's there's your that's, new nickname, One me. Take Drew. Uh, they already call me that. I, I really <laughs> live Drew, but I'll, I'll be one take drill. So. <laughs> he is the <laughs> WWE champion, Drew McIntyre. Follow him on Twitter at D McIntyre WWE. Catch him, well, catch him somewhere. He he's either going to be on SmackDown Friday nights, eight PM Eastern, seven PM Central on Fox here in Austin. That's Fox Seven Austin, or Monday nights. He'll continue terrorizing the Raw roster. Monday nights, 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central on the USA Network. Drew, it's so good to talk to you. All the best to you and your family. Uh, look forward to seeing many more months of you as WWE champion, and I hope we get to run into each other soon. But until then, be well and be safe. Well, thank you, buddy. I appreciate you having me on. And sure enough, when things open back up, we'll do this in person. <laughs>